So, all throughout history, and in all cultures around the world, humans have fantasized about transcending those meat sacks that we are born into. <laughs> if you look at the classics like Hercules, or modern Marvel comics, Spider-Man, or the, the latest computer games, they all explore this urge that a lot of us have inside. But let me tell you, as a matter of fact, we already, today in 2016, live in the age of cyborgs. The only thing, though, is that they don't look like Hollywood has portrayed them for us. They are not the Robocops and Terminators of pop culture. They look a lot more like this. <laughs> These are real cyborgs. <laughs> These, this is the friendly lady next door, or it could actually be anyone sitting in this room. It's these people who have smart technology under their skins, in the shape of pacemakers, or uh, cochlear implants, or insulin pumps, that are now smart and connected, and controls various functions in the body. So let me give you some more concrete stories around this. So, uh, looking at these four people, uh, they all have various types of um, smart technology that has enabled them to new, do new things. The lady on top here, for example, she was born deaf, but at the age of 39, she got these hearing implants that allowed her to hear human voices for the very first time. There's a very touching video online about that. In this corner, there is a gentleman who got blind at about the age of 30. But more than 30 years later, he received a retinal implant that is connected to this little camera you can see in the glasses that allowed him to again see the face of his wife after more than 30 years. In this corner is another gentleman who had a terrible accident in 2010 and hurt his spine so bad that he lost the control of his legs. But now, thanks to smart uh, implants into his spine, connected to an exoskeleton, he's able to get out of his wheelchair and walk down a corridor again. And to give you an illustration of the latest generation of smart prosthetics, like this gentleman here in the lower corner is wearing, you see that they are not the sort of sleeves that you would put on, like in the Captain Hook days. The latest prosthetics are integrated with the bone, uh, so that it sits very securely. And they also have integrated uh, sensors into the muscles, so you can control it directly by moving your muscles with a great precision. So, my friends, we live in a time where, thanks to technology, we can make deaf people hear again, we can make the blind see again, and we can make the lame walk again. Isn't that fantastic? Now then, uh, what about those of us who modern medical science consider healthy? Well, enter the biohackers. <laughs> we biohackers, this is a picture from a recent biohacker meetup in Stockholm, by the way. So we biohackers, it's a very diverse global community of people who are experimenting with the latest biotechnology and sensor technology, taking existing gadgets and trying to hack them and see if we can discover new uses for them. And it's a movement which is distanced from big university research institutes or corporate interests. We like to see ourselves as a third force of citizen scientists and do-it-yourself uh, makers and shakers and hackers. Uh, trying to understand and explore the new uses of technology. And together in the biohacker movement, we are trying to see what can we do with these new technologies that are becoming democratized, that used to be really expensive, it could only sit in very fancy high-tech labs, but are suddenly available to have in a garage or in a student dorm. So I'll give you some nice examples from the biohacker universe. So starting from the upper right, uh, here I'm with uh, a gentleman, Sean, who, has, who is a member of the uh, 
biohacker group in the States called Grindhouse Wetware. He has implanted uh, some LED lights under his arm, just because you can. And this was at the recent, <laughs> at the recent Cyborg Festival here in, in, in Düsseldorf in Germany. On top here is another gentleman who has hacked his earring aids so that he can hear Wi-Fi. Now, isn't that a great sense for the 21st century? In this corner is another gentleman who is uh, Amal Grafstra, who runs uh, a business called Dangerous Things. They, do, uh, the, they de develop the, the new generation of smart implants that you can use, that are encrypted, you can use them for payments and riding public transport, etc. So it's a very exciting development. Down here is the lady, Moon Rebus. She has a chip implant in her arm that is uh, connected to her smartphone, and it's... Uh, she has in turn connected this to the global system of seismographic sensors. You know, uh, the devices that tell you if there is an earthquake somewhere on Earth. And when there is one, she feels the vibrations directly in her arms. So she is directly connected to a whole planet. And I mean, it could be any planet. You could also do the same connection to the moon, for example. And down in... Um, in the bottom here, we have a, a Berlin-based biohacker, which is uh, also a leader in the field, left and on. And she's also a star and a role model for many of us. And over here is the latest device from a, another hacker group called Cyborg Nest. It's, it's a little implant that allows you to feel uh, the magnetic north pole. So giving us the sense that birds have so that you can navigate feeling the magnetic fields of the planet. Now, uh, for me, um, my favorite is in uh, this technology where, where I can do, uh, get new functions. So I have experimented, and I have a tiny little chip implant here in my hand. And my uh, purpose with this implant is to uh, get rid of all the junk, you know, that we have to carry in our pockets, like keys or swipe cards, everything that is in our wallets. We manage decently to get rid of coins, right? But we still carry around these metal objects in our pockets called keys, which in fact is a technology that hasn't changed since Roman times. Um, and here's an illustration simply around my hand of the stuff that I have replaced with my chip. So if we start from clockwise uh, or counterclockwise upstairs, it's memberships and discounts in various shops around Sweden. It's keys for uh, uh, padlocks and cupboards. It's my business card. If someone wants to swipe my hand, you will get my contacts straight into your phone. I can also store data like a USB uh, in my hand chip. I have my gym card, there's a pin code on that post-it note, which means that instead of typing the pin code 20 times a day on my phone, I just swipe it with my implant to unlock it. Uh, there's also the badge that I use to go into my office, to mm, open the copying machine, turn off the alarm, etc., etc. All the functions you would do in a, in a normal office. We also make Bitcoin payments using these chip implants. Well, I could go on and on, but there are companies developing platforms of services for this exciting new technology. So, but if those of you who know this a little bit, you will say to me, chip implants is not exactly a new technology. We've seen them around since, uh, I mean, for more than 30 years. We've put them in animals uh, in an industrial scale since the 1990s. Well, why is it then interesting suddenly in 2016? The explanation is that we, the world around us is changing very rapidly because of the explosion of the Internet of Things. All these smart connected devices around us, you know what language they speak? They don't speak Swedish very well, I've learned. They speak the languages with each other of Wi-Fi, of Bluetooth, and of near-field communication. So by putting an NFC, a near-field communication chip in my hand, it gives my body the ability to speak the language of the machines. Billions of them. It's a nice hack. Um, and what this has led to in turn was not exactly something we planned, but the, an enormous interest for this technology. So now I spend a fair bit of my time traveling the world, hosting implant parties. <laughs> I've been part of uh, chip implanting hundreds of people all over the planet. People come together in groups and, you know, share the experience and then we together, as biohackers, try to explore new and exciting uses for this technology. 
And by the way, it's not just chip implants that you use for opening doors. That's really a very basic uh, use. But there are today on the market chip implants that can, for example, log your temperature, your pulse, or even your blood sugar level. So we're really seeing a stage now when smart health implants are coming into the market. And I am quite convinced that 10 years from now, a lot of people will be wearing smart chip implants logging their health simply because it will give them great insights into what their bodies are up to. But this is part of a greater trend. If you look at tech trends in general, there, are, uh, the there is the observation that things often start big, as in this case, music players. They are of the size that you need to have them on a desktop. Over time, they develop and they become smaller, and at the same time, the quality improves. So then we get like the, this iconic from the 1980s, the yellow Sony Walkman, right? And then we have the latest generation of music players that are so small, you can stick them in the air. This one, the Brogy Dash, has a memory capacity of four gigabytes. It can hold thousands of songs, and you can just stick it in your ear. And this applies to a lot of technologies, not just music players. You see the same happening with computers, with cameras, and waiting around the corner, for example, with exoskeletons or DNA analysis equipment that are also on this shrinking path, coming to the point, at least exciting for us biohackers, when we can stick them into our bodies and integrate them with bodily functions. But wait, Hannes, is this some kind of teenage boys room fantasy? We're all going to be superheroes and have these weird, you know, capabilities to see in the dark and swim underwater with our artificial implanted gills. Is that what this is about? <laughs> no, my friends. It's not what it's about. It's not about hacking your body to make show off to your pals. This is, goes much deeper than that. The, the, the ideas and thinking behind these body hacking. And it comes down to uh, the fact that our species, Homo sapiens, we were developed in a world that is radically different from the one we inhabit today. The world of 2016 is we, we as a species are not suited so much for the 21st century. We developed in a time when we were very few people living on the savanna with access to very limited technology. And this affects all dimensions of our being. Our bodies, our senses, what we perceive, and not least our psychology. So let me give you some examples what we have today that we didn't have back then and try to connect these things. I mean, today we have weapons of mass destruction. And the reason we have it is because we have this Stone Age psyche that my tribe must have the power to kick the ass of that other guy's tribe. You know, and that is not good when we have a Stone Age mentality and we have modern day destruction technology. There is another example, the access to information we have today thanks to internet and science, the insights we have. Really, we are still making most of our decisions made on sort of hunches and gut feelings when there is really information out there that we should use for making decisions. And the third example, the abundance of junk food. Our instincts, our body tells us, stuff our faces with fat and sugar and salt because it feels great, right? But it's killing us. Our bodies developed for a different time, are not adapted to the 21st century. So the question is, what do we need to change? If we can fix things, what should we be looking at? Well, our thinking is this. What if, with modern technology, we could really change ourselves to perceive, to directly perceive how we are messing up this planet, what we are doing to it? Would we treat it differently then? Or even better, what if, with the help of modern technology, we can log every ongoing process in our bodies, the hormones and the sugars and everything that is going on. But what if we could connect this insight to that of another person? 
What if we really could feel and understand what another person is feeling? Would we treat them differently then? I think so. So my friends, <laughs> my message to you is, human augmentation is here. It's sorely needed. So please join me in welcoming the cyborgs in our midst. Thank you.